Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's speaker with friends. Uh, we've had a bit of a slow start. I think um, possibly the Christmas season has uh, affected a few people. So we are gradually getting more and more now. So apologies for the late uh, beginning. We'll try not to hold you up at the end. Um, welcome to this one, our last speaker of 2022. I'm sure by now you've realised that uh, we are uh, talking about SDG 15, life on land. And we're joined by two experts on the subjects of green infrastructure, biodiversity, community engagement and nature based solutions um, that will hopefully tackle our current climate and biodiversity crises. I'm going to hear about Liverpool's amazing green up project, which quite honestly, I think you'll agree by the end of this needs to be rolled out in every city and town in the UK and beyond. And we have a lot to get through. Um, presentations from both Juliet and Elaine, so welcome to both of them. And for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Romy, I'm the Commercial Director at Vestra here in the UK. I should just mention we're recording this webinar for catch-up purposes, which I hope is okay, but please um, stay out of sight if, uh, if that concerns you in any way. Um, so a little bit more on SDG 15. I'm sure anyone who's joined us before is aware that this series of speakers is to um, bring the SDGs to life and uh, try and uh, share ways of us all acting upon them and within them. And the goal of SDG 15, Life on Land, is, is very broad. So this conversation today around um, urban green up might best be summarised by 15.9, which is to uh, integrate ecosystem and biodiversity values into national and local planning development processes, poverty reduction strategies and accounts. And I think uh, by the end of it, you'll agree that it's actually very well focused in that area. I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. Please drop them into the Q&A tab rather than the chat tab if you can, so as not to confuse me and uh, get involved in the conversation after the presentations. So Dr. Juliet Staples is going to speak first, followed by Elaine Cresswell. Um, for about the next half hour, and then we'll chat and uh, finish off hopefully within about an hour or so. So over to you, Juliet. I'll stop sharing now. Hello, thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm just going to open yes. my screen now. Okay, I'll go dark. Okay, can I just check that everyone can see my screen? Yes, that's all good, thanks. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much for asking me to talk today. So I'm talking to you about the Urban Green Up project and about the nature-based solutions that we've been delivering under this project in Liverpool. I have just one moment, my screen doesn't seem to want to move. Sorry, it's not moving, let's try that. Resume share. Let's try again. Okay, bear with me. I'm just going to try and put it back on slideshow one more time. That's fine. Okay. I just want to go to full screen. Okay, I won't delay. I'll move on to the second screen. Can I just ask that you can still see the second slide? Yes, that's fine. Okay, if for some reason to... it won't go to full screen. Okay, okay. All right, sorry about that. I don't know what's no happening. No worries. Um, so the Horizon, the Urban Green Up project is a Horizon 2020 funded project by the EU. It's worth about 40 million euros between the, the UK, uh, Spain and Turkey. Um, Liverpool's got about 4 million euros worth of funding and we're one of three frontrunner cities. And the consortium in the city is the City Council with the University of Liverpool and the Mersey Forest. And we've got some global follower cities keen to copy what, what we've done and what's worked well in, this, in Liverpool. And we have a network of affiliated cities that are just keen to listen and learn as well. The main focus of what we're doing is it's about research and innovation. It's, a, it's very much kind of an innovative approach when we are trialing and monitoring the retrofitting of a whole range of different nature-based solutions in the city. And we're looking at their environmental, social, and their economic benefits as well. Uh, sorry, for some reason, I'm gonna have to just move down. It doesn't want to shift at all. Sorry, I've got an IT glitch here. It won't. Let me uh, move. 
I'm not sure why there that's right. happening. Okay, there yeah. you go. Okay. Gone, yeah, it's gone on now. Sorry, I don't know. Okay. It must be. I think it's, it's just slow. So, yeah, it probably is. Sorry about that. So uh, the first scheme is uh, Urban Catchment Forestry Tree Sustainable Urban Drainage System. So this is um, a project that happened in a very key part of the city. So it's very visible. Um, it's right in the heart of the city on the main thoroughfare. And we've got a central reservation here where we've put in uh, 20 sustainable urban drainage trees. And as you can see on the top left image, they're planted in this long soil filled trench. Uh, and those big, big Lego sort of um, components that you can see there, they're silver cells and they're filled with soil and you can see gaps in them where the trees go. The way this system works is during periods of very high rainfall uh, um, when we've got lots of ex excess surface water on the highway, the water from the highway drains into the first of the run of these trees. So these images show a central run of eight trees. So the water runs into the first tree and then it runs the whole way down that soil filled trench through all the other set of trees and then exits finally at the end. And what that does is as the water flows through from the carriageway, um, the soil soaks up the water. The trees also take up and remove some of the water for their own transpiration and well-being, et cetera. And the water that eventually comes out at the other end is reduced in volume because some of it's obviously been used and held. It's also um, filtered through the soil, so it's often much cleaner as well. And there's often a delay because it's, it takes a lot longer for the water to flow through the soil than it does to rush along um, a tarmac gully, for example. And that helps to spread out the rate at which water goes into the drainage and helps to prevent surface water flooding. So there's quite a lot of benefits with this. Um, and of course, the trees also, by being there, are adding shading, cooling, and biodiversity as well. And we've had quite a lot of interest in this particular scheme. I'm going to have the same problem again. And let me, there you go. Um, so some early data shown here. Um, the graph in the middle the, is um, about the depth of water uh, in the, the, along each of those trees, really, in the measuring areas. So if you, the blue line is the inflow. It's tree number one. It's where the water's coming into the system on that run of eight. And the, the spikes on the blue graph there, that uh, completely mirrors the rainfall. So that's very much an indication of what is happening in kind of real time. The line underneath, the brown line underneath, is the depth of water at the final tree, the eighth tree. And you can see how the peaks have been flattened and how uh, the trees have attenuated some of that excess water and held it within the system. So we know that they're functioning fairly well. If you look at the right to that, you can see an image of two test tubes. Um, and the one on the left that is black and oily, and that's the water that's coming in directly off the road surface, which has been on one. And the one on the right that is uh, slightly lighter brown in color, um, is the one at the end of the eighth tree. So we can see that the soil is providing some kind of filtering. We don't unfortunately have our water quality data just yet, but we're hoping that um, just visually we can see the improvement and the, that the water data will bear this out. And underneath there's an image there of a soil life sensor. So these have been buried under the first and the last tree, uh, and they record a whole range of features from oxygen conductivity, uh, soil moisture, etc. And collectively, this, these data sets will help us to quantify the benefits from these trees. Um, but unfortunately, we're just at the stage now where we're beginning to gather this. Yep. Next one is a rain garden um, that we've put in uh, on Upper Pitt Street in Liverpool. So this is the first urban city rain garden that's gone in. Uh, this particular rain garden we think will take an, an annual volume of rainfall of 420 metre cubes per year. And if you look at the image on very right, you can see that underneath the rain garden, there's a kind of a crate permavoid system. And that will store in this particular case up to another four metres cubed of water. And you, you see the theme is, although we're talking about life on land, these are kind of water images uh, and water projects because Liverpool has something like the fourth highest surface water flood risk in the UK. And so these are very much features, uh, projects that we can hopefully use and use again across um, the city. So the way that this has been designed here is that the rain garden is in three distinct beds. And that's only because we've had to uh, accommodate utilities crossing it. Uh, we've got three different soil beds, so we've used three different soil mixes. We've planted a range of wet and dry tolerant species, as well as plants that are able to phytoremediate and take up and clean the soil. And we've put soil moisture sensors in each of them as well. Um, looking at some of the early data uh, for the rain garden here, um, we've, this is to do with precipitation. So to the left, there's the shorter blue line. So kind of regular on off rainfall throughout the day. And what we're finding here is under these kinds of conditions, uh, the rain garden basically is able to accommodate um, the entire water and nothing actually goes to drain at all. 
And then we, on the right hand side, we've got something a little bit different. We've got a very high precipitation in a very short space of time. And this is where the rain garden is, is holding back of the water so mm. just at the stage now, but we're beginning to start looking at that in a bit more detail to find out the trigger volumes and the trigger points. The data kind of we've got now, we've got um, flow meters in there. So I'm able to look at things like velocity and depth and estimate the water that's flowing through the system. That's from the, the, the uh, top detect data uh, screen grab there. And underneath I've got some uh, screen grab from the soil moisture sensors. Um, so these, um, as I said, one placed in each, each of the beds. Each of the beds, the soil mix is uh, compost with different levels of horticultural grit. But in one of them, the blue line, we have taken the opportunity to add some recycled aggregate as well. And what we're doing here is looking at how effective the different soil mixes are and which is going to be the best going forward. So it's just another opportunity to innovate and research. So I'm hoping for great things from the rain garden, but it has only gone in recently in the last few months and we've still got some work to do on the data. One of the other things we've put in is a floating ecosystem island. So this has gone into a park lake. Um, and the reason we've put this here is this park lake is uh, high nutrient levels in the water. Uh, and we've have a number of algal blooms that often mean the lake has to be closed during the summer. The picture of the island is a little bit out of date now because um, this year the vegetation was so tall that it was taller than the person standing on the island. So the, the growth has been very successful. And the way this works is the roots of those plants, those reeds and flowering plants, penetrate the island into the water underneath where they take up some of those excess nutrients. Uh, so we're taking away some of the nutrients, putting it into plant growth. And then more recently, we've also added three small leaky dams on one of the key tributaries to this park lake. Uh, and we know that this tributary is very high in phosphorus, phosphates and some of the other eutrophication chemicals. Um, so yeah, we're looking to see what will happen with the combined impact of both. The early data, I've talked about the good growth of vegetation. It's so good now that we're actually going to have to think about clearing some so that it can actually grow again next year. In terms of invertebrate species and improvements, we've seen some improvement, but uh, there's not a lot of good habitat nearby. So I think that's been a little bit restricted. We do have some early water data here. Um, there's been a clear reduction in nitrates since the island went in, which is really good. And we don't have the data back yet from the leaky dams. But we're hoping um, the literature suggests that they will be particularly effective at reducing the phosphate levels and hopefully maybe heavy metals as well. So uh, we'll have a fuller story in the next few months. But despite all that, I think the island has been in that for two years. It's pretty well established. The leaky dams have gone in. And despite hot weather this summer, uh, for the first time in a long time, we didn't get any algal blooms. So it is hinting that between them, we may be, you know, they may be helping to resolve the issue. We've also put in a number of um, living green walls in the city. This is a soil based system um, in a very urban part of the city that before had very little. Um, and we're testing lots of different, looking at lots of different issues here, not just the biodiversity, but the, the cooling, the thermoregulation, the air quality, perceptions, et cetera. Uh, and it's been complemented by two other walls we've put in. The top one here, the very long dim one, is a hydroponic system. Um, so the, the plants are grown in rock wool with a nutrient solution um, and the water's from rainwater harvesting. Uh, and then below that, the one that's gone in most recently is on the main uh, uh, facade of the, the, the Strand, which is a really busy road in the city. It's, it's lower, it's freestanding, dual planting with different aspects, looking very much about how this impacts on air quality with that road being so close. But taking all the green walls together and having a quick look at some general data, our early data uh, indicates that for most of these vertical green structures, what we are finding is that the air quality, in particular the small um, 2.5 micron particulate matter, does seem to be improved and it seems to be reduced and there is a general improvement in air quality in the immediate vicinity, presumably because the plants and the leaves are trapping some of those fine particles. We don't see anything quite so similar with the nitrogen dioxide from the vehicles, um, which would, would probably make sense. Uh, but we also see some, some really good thermoregulatory data, uh, quite significant. Um, and just for illustration purposes there, I've just put one of the thermal imaging uh, pictures up, which kind of shows during a um, really hot day in, the, in, in a couple of summers ago, you know, temperatures of like, I think it's 42 degrees on the road, you know, we're, we're, but closer in by the um, wall, et cetera, down to 25. So we've got quite a lot of thermal imaging data to support this. Biodiversity with green walls um, is something that we've, you know, one of the reasons we put these in was to look at the biodiversity. Um, and this is quite a complicated slide. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but the images on the left, the kind of the lighter color, the yellows with all the, the soft pastels, um, they're the 
um, the controls and the interventions for two of those green wall sites that I showed you. So it's just looking at two different sites and that's the planting. And so we've had some um, kind of element of control over that because the uh, the big, the taller banded sections are obviously the interventions we've actually put in ourselves. So we've controlled that. If we look across on the right, the kind of the bluey purple colored graph, you can see on, on those maybe, I should point out that the uh, vertical axes aren't the same on each of these because we're still in the early days of data analysis. Um, but you can see that the control on the first green wall, there, there was a mix of species there and that you can see on the intervention, the very far one on the top, top right square, uh, that we've actually been able to attract additional pollinator groups as a result of that planting. But if you look below on uh, the Par Street one, and you're looking at the bottom corner of the graph here, you can see that there was nothing on that road really before. Uh, but we have actually been able to attract a, a number of pollinator species, but maybe not as many. And I think in looking at this and looking at where the walls are, we are coming to the conclusion that um, it, you can have a wall and it can, it can be wonderful in terms of creating biodiversity, but unless you have the stepping stone areas to allow the pollinators to move and colonize it or find it, um, you're never gonna get the full effect. So St. John at the top, it has that, it has the pollinator roof nearby, it has planting in the city and a park opposite. But the one at the bottom, the Park Street one, is very much an isolated urban area. So it's great that we've got something, but we need to build those stepping stones in. Looking at a number of nature-based solutions as well, we've also been looking at the walking and cycling and how they may have contributed to active travel. And although there's lots of other things to consider, uh, you know, like COVID changes of behaviour and changes in the city, for example, very simply looking at numbers of people travelling by, by foot or by bike before the nature-based solutions went in and after, we are seeing an increase. And I think we can say that they are forming part of that package of uh, activity changes in the cities are encouraging more people to travel more actively. And then just the last couple of slides really, um, one of the models we're using to help generate some, um, some of the benefits and to help quantify some of them um, is something called GI Val, Green Infrastructure Valuation. And this is a toolkit that's been developed by one of our partners and is underpinned by lots of other toolkits and accredited systems. So um, this is the kind of the environment page for climate, water, biodiversity. So to pick out just a couple, if I look down the middle of the slide um, there, carbon sequestered by trees, it says 155,000 carbon um, kilograms of carbon uh, sequestered. Uh, and doing some quick sums and looking at that, that probably equates to about 34 cars, each doing 11,500 miles in a year, uh, which is an idea. And then further down um, on the water management, there's one there that, that potentially all the schemes, and I've just shown you a couple, we've got about 40. Um, uh, over 6 million litres of water diverted from sewers um, per year, and that's the equivalent of about 16, 25 metres swimming pools. So we are we are having a measurable impact. Um, and then on the social uh, aspects from the GI Val, um, lots of data there, but then they're suggesting maybe 11 lives potentially saved per year by increased walking, cycling and reduced air pollution. And it says, interestingly, it says it suggests about 10 volunteers now I know from Elaine's work alone, we've probably got at least double that. So some elements of this are probably a little bit conservative. And then the final one, economic, because it's important that we look at the whole range of the benefits. Uh, and this generates information about potential savings from tourism, tourism and full-time jobs. And at the bottom there, uh, the slides could be shared. Um, I've got the, the link for that GI valuation tool, uh, but this will be obviously complemented by a whole range of other monitoring and, and tools, et cetera. So that's probably a quick overview of what I've wanted to talk about to show you some of the diversity of different types of projects we've done. Um, Elaine's going to, Elaine from Reshaped will speak next, uh, but I just thought before she does, just to say that we commissioned, the City Council commissioned Elaine um, and Slavia uh, to look at some very hard to tackle city spaces with a view to increasing their biodiversity. We wanted them to be innovative. We wanted them to challenge the way we did things normally. We wanted them to consider things like sustainability and low maintenance. Um, I hope that when you've heard Elaine speak, you'll think that they've done a fantastic job and that we're really pleased with the way that that's going. So thank you. I'll stop sharing now and apologies for the glitches before. Thanks, Juliette. We're having a glitchy day. Um, just to apologise to everybody who's joined late. Uh, firstly, this is being recorded, so we will share the recording and you can catch up then. Um, secondly, we're not entirely sure what's happened. It seems to have been a glitch in Zoom where the link was correct, but when you clicked on it, you were taken to 
the wrong one. Uh, we're not sure how that's happened at all, but hopefully everybody has made it through now. So uh, there's plenty more to come. Elaine, are you ready to share your information? Yeah. Just very quickly, if anybody does have any questions, um, do please drop them into the Q&A tab and we'll pick those up after Elaine's presentation. Is that a full, a full screen? I think so. It's different to when we looked. I know, it's really strange, isn't it? Okay. But can you just see the presentation and um, just the presentation? Yeah. We can, I think so. It's a different layout, but we can see it's the really, slide. It's, so it's really strange. I'm just going to um, just yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, all right. Thank, thanks, Juliet, for a really kind of generous introduction. Um, the, the thing I really find special about Green Up is the opportunity to go beyond uh, research projects that say landscape is good and get real hard data that shows which aspects of landscape really make a difference. As a landscape architect, I really feel that Urban Green Up project redefined success and freed us from to experiment, get things wrong, accidentally get things right, and find more effective ways to improve the sustainability of our city. I love this picture for many reasons. It was taken by a member of the public on the hottest day of the year, who deliberately cycled to see how the planting was coping in the 40 degree heat. I love his level of engagement and that people are compelled to walk through the planting to taste the fennel, hear the bees buzzing and be immersed in nature. I love that McDonald's staff have decided to litter pick every day and even told me off last week for pulling out the weeds. And the thing that I really, really love the most about this beautiful planting is that I found a number of dead half eaten seagulls in the middle of it. That's a bit of a strange thing to say until you realize that the presence of the seagull means that by planting such resilient, engaging plants, the whole food chain, including the pollinators, birds, foxes, and decomposers have shown up. The story of the fox and the seagull started three years ago when Reshaped and Flavia Goldsworthy were commissioned to leave, leave the Baltic pollinators planting aspect of the Urban Green Up project. Our brief was to increase the abundance and diversity of pollinators on five verge sites between Duke Street and Liverpool South Docks. Our sites were typical of the leftover spaces in Liverpool city centre and the hardest to develop. They included a concrete revetment bank with moss, gravel and no soil, lawn under existing plane trees, a dead shrub bed, mown roadside verges and um, it's just a bit of waste of leftover land between, between footpaths. Whilst it is not unusual for cities to carry out this type of pollinator project, it is unusual for their impacts to be monitored and analysed over a four year time span. Unsurprisingly, baseline surveys showed that our intervention sites were not very diverse and were mostly full of low value uh, and low valued pollinators. Important pollinators such as bumblebees, solitary wasps, solitary bees, pollen beetles, moths, butterflies, bats and hoverflies were largely absent. The location of our sites were also very spread out and our small budget couldn't hope to create a climate resilient wildlife corridor. In order to address these issues, we adapted our brief and created a landscape character plan to link the green up sites with surrounding habitat stepping stones and community allotments, future developments and gardens. Our landscape characters were inspired by the Sefton coast and graded from open exposed sand dunes to woodlands and gardens. This enabled us to choose plants that were suitable for local environmental conditions, didn't need much maintenance and provided the rich whole life cycle food, shelter and hibernation resources that pollinators needed. These pictures on the slide show um, the inspiration between, um, for our, our planting, um, which included an old map of the Sefton Coast and beautiful bouquets of coastal flowers um, that I collected on, on one day trip. 
It is essential that we did no harm to pollinators that we were trying to encourage and, and delivered on the climate change objectives of the Urban Green Up project. COVID lockdowns gifted us time to develop and trial a number of experimental, no chemical and low embodied carbon techniques, the impact of which are currently being assessed by Liverpool John Moores University Carbon Eco Inventory Unit. This diagram shows the circular use of materials between all the pollinator sites. You can see that we avoided vehicle movements by reusing material removed from one site to create um, a, a, another site. On the Park Lane site, for example, we use granite sets um, removed from um, near the trees um, to create a wander path through the new planting. The tarmac and gravel underneath the tarmac near the trees um, were used on our coastal site to create gravel mulch, and the tree stumps were given to lo local community groups as seeds. I could talk all day about our interventions, including how we got the plants to grow on this concrete revetment bank. But as it, the presentation is only 15 minutes long, I'll focus on our coastal strand site shown on my first slide. The coastal strand site is very exposed to sun and wind and was covered by intensively mown lawn. Soil was thin and largely comprised of brick rubble. Baseline surveys show that there were a few clovers and buttercups in the expansive grass areas, but um, there wasn't really anything too significant. In order to avoid herbicide use and transportation of materials off site, we cleared our intervention site by stripping the turf and weed seed bank from our planting area, um, which is on the left of the slide. And um, we placed it at the boundary of the site on the right, um, on the right of the slide. The weed seed um, bank um, regenerated and created a new meadow covered in geraniums and sunflowers and provided an important pollinator resource while we planted the rest of the site. We then covered our intervention site with sand to shade out further weed seed germination, which also had the effect of making hand weeding really easy, promoted a robust root growth capable of withstanding last year's heat and provided hibernation resources for ground nesting bees in winter. Our pollinator planting was monitored using quadrats during the first two years of the project as a baseline during delivery and one year post delivery. The raw data is currently being sense checked, interrogated, and early stories being teased out. Visually, the differences between our control lawn site and our planted intervention site are huge. And you would imagine this would also mean that our planting was better for pollinators. The fantastic thing about the Green Up project is that we don't need to make these assumptions as we actually have the data to back up our ideas. The bars represent average numbers found in each meter squared of the survey. The blue bar represents the control site and the orange bar represents the intervention site. That, this, this bar chart shows the number of flowers with, with nectar resources in each one meter squared quadrat is 400% greater in the intervention site than the control site during summer, 600% in spring, and 1,500% in autumn. The diversity of plant families with different nectar resources and habitat resources to offer pollinators is 300% greater in the intervention site than the control site during summer and autumn and 800% in spring. Our early data suggests that this increase in flowers and plant diversity has also led to increases in pollinator numbers. There were 350% more pollinators on the intervention site than the control site in summer and 1,100% in autumn. This autumnal increase in pollinator numbers was noticeable on site and directly related to the week when native flowers stopped flowering. Despite the low numbers of pollinators in spring, this chart shows that they were much more diverse than on the control site. The pollinators diversity rose still further on the intervention site in autumn after native plants stopped flowering. The control survey showed that a few pollinators used the buttercups and the daisies on the control site. 
The ecologists had noticed, however, that they did not use the pollinators did not use the control site for long, as the grass is mown frequently. Whereas the pollinators on our planting um, were found on six different plant groups, the echium being the most important species throughout the summer. After the echium and other native plants stopped flowering, the pollinators all moved to the ornamental species that were still flowering, the most popular of which were the hollyhocks, fennel and the artichoke. By May, by May, we should have a diagram like this showing more detailed plant species and pollinator interactions, which is exactly as, what I need as a landscape architect to improve the impact of my planting designs. Going forward, data needs to be interrogated further and we need to find funding to continue monitoring for the next two years. It would be such a shame to stop at year one before we find out how resilient these biodiversity improvements are to our harsh winter vandalism and the worst that climate change can bring. I'd like to see how plant and pollinator populations and associations between them develop over time and expand monitoring to the whole food web so that we can determine our impact on bats, foxes, birds, and decomposers. I'm going to end on this beautiful picture of planting in October. I hope that next time you pass a grass bird, you will wonder if it could be like this and maybe even support a few dead seagulls and foxes of its own. I'd like to thank you all for joining us um, on a Friday afternoon. If you'd like to hear more about the Urban Green Up project, please follow me and Juliet on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and I look forward to any questions that you're going to ask us as detailed as possible, please. Thanks, Elaine. That was excellent. Can you stop sharing and I'll uh, just put the holding slide up and then bring you and Juliet back in. Um, it's it's there's just so much information, isn't there? I think it's uh, too much to take in in one sitting like this. You know, you do need to interrogate it further. But I think one of the most valuable parts of it is that um, you've got all the data and analysis in the background there that that is just going to be so helpful for um, people to look at in future, particularly. Um, so I just wanted to ask. There's one question here from Stephen in the uh, Q and A tab. Um, I don't think it is really off subject, to be honest, Stephen. I mean, he's talking about London, where the ultra low emission zone is being extended to outer London, um, and cars will obviously be charged in that unless they're a low emission vehicle. Um, but he says that when you examine the London pollution map, high levels of pollution in outer London is not area right area wide, but limited to a few hot spots on routes into central London mainly. So could this kind of green infrastructure be used to help reduce pollution from vehicles at these hotspots? Is his question to you. Would you, would you like me to answer, Juliet, to answer? Yes, yes I think so, or both, yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Um, it's, good, it's a good question. I mean, our work is still quite early um, in its stages. So that is quite an interesting thing that we've seen with the vertical green infrastructure, the reduction in fine, particulates in in the air I think there is opportunity to have um, areas of the planting that will help to improve local air quality but I think it, it's about understanding how it works and um, I think what happens is uh, to the best of my knowledge is that the plants attract uh, they kind of capture some of those fine particles and they kind of stay effectively stuck to the leaves and then when it rains they wash to the floor so we're not the plants aren't actually doing anything with the pollution and the particulates that are there, but they're just changing mm. the way that the um, particles are distributed in the atmosphere. Um, and I suppose the other thing to bear in mind is that they will eventually obviously wash off to the ground, but then, you know, under certain conditions of maybe heavy rain, they can be resuspended. But I do think that um, early data is looking quite promising, and uh, I do think it's something that can be considered. No, that's that's brilliant. I'm sure it it doesn't matter where you're talking about the same principles apply. Elaine, did you have anything else to add no, to I, that? I think um, yeah, I, 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 I recall with uh, with Juliet and what she said. Mm. I mean, I suppose the one thing I'll say is that quite a lot of the interventions at um at, at junctions um have focused upon um putting climbers in boxes. 
Um, mm. And you've got to look at it in terms of whether it's robust for the future and how much maintenance it, it's going to require. Really, in my view, plants belong in the ground and that's the most sustainable way to, um, to, to, to plant them. And if you put, for example, ivy in boxes, the soil isn't deep enough for them, you know, if they if they actually get going as young ivy is quite vulnerable to um to kind of poor, poor environments um so even if they start start growing are they going to need maintenance and can run all over the road and as their climbers and and trailers so i think it's got to be done with consideration um yes. and with knowledgeable experts um gu guiding the nature-based solution that's chosen not just choose anything just because um it's worked in this setting without properly understanding the, the type of plant and the right place to be planting it yes sure well there's a question from chris gray i don't know if you've been reading ahead <laughs> that was a really good no, segue <laughs> uh, he says really interesting pre presentations thanks um he missed the start of the presentation but can you share any information on maintenance costs i know you do have uh, comparisons for those. And he's asking for green walls in particular, because when he tries to make the case for, or she, sorry, it's a Chris, when uh, they try to make the case to clients for green walls, they always get resistance due to failure rates and perceived expense of ongoing maintenance. So you've touched on that. I don't know if you could specifically I mean, we've, talk we've, through. With, with green, Juliet will be able to tell you more precisely. I can tell you the, the maintenance costs of, um, of my planting which um it was a hundred a thousand meters squared and i think um it, we ended up kind of providing kind of maintenance um budget over about ten thousand but practically none of it's been spent um so you know it, it for, for planting in the ground it's actually particularly where it's suitable planting for the environment and using this kind of very mixed naturalistic approach very very little is required probably more than it had it, it required a little bit more than it had um but uh, at the moment we're just managing it with um green gym coming once every two months and the occasional i i, I go out and pull some of the weeds during my lunch hour um mm. just as i'm passing but really it's no more than five minutes um and that's um all the strand site is needed all year even during the um uh, during the heat wave and um, the reason we we think um, these plants are white and even thrived and you wouldn't believe the condition they went in the contractor really wasn't able to handle the plants correctly and um, the, some of the plants I, I really thought they wouldn't survive when we put when we put them in but they really really thrived and um, so with, with just nothing we think it's due to the sand mulch because we think that it um, encouraged the um, the roots downwards into the very bricky substrate and that's mm. actually created a very robust plant that can cope with crazy temperatures without any any watering. So I'm going to leave um, Juliet to talk about the costs in comparison um, mm. of the of the great green walls. Hello. Yeah, I'd just like to quickly go back to um, the previous one about um, air quality and just to say. Um, one of the things that is key, Elaine was talking about putting plants in the ground, one of the things is the location. And the location is absolutely key because of all the air currents and the air eddies and stuff. And there's some really good work by Dr. James Levine from Birmingham University, if anyone's particularly interested, he's got some quite nice publications out that graphically show that and how important it is about where you actually put your roadside hedge to actually get the maximum impact. So yeah, so location is important. In terms mm. of the green wall, uh, the kind of cost you're looking at for um, say 100, and 30 meters kind of squared of planting it's probably something in the region of about seven seven and a half thousand pounds a year so it does come with quite a maintenance burden in that respect but that said that for that you would get from a company you would probably get well you would get monthly visits uh, some of those might be general housekeeping just tidying and trimming some of them will be like cutting down the wall um, at the end of the autumn ready for the spring but what you have to remember is in, included within that is um, all kinds of like treatments uh, for the wall might need. Each of those species in the wall will have a different requirement. Some will need a light trim, some will need a heavy cutback to generate for next year. And they'll all have different life, um, life lengths as well. So some plants might live happily in the wall for five years, some only for two years. And there's a bit of an art in the mosaic of replacing them on those maintenance visits to ensure that the wall always looks green um, 
and lovely. So the we, we were fortunate that we got capital funding. So the wall was put in on uh, capital funding and we put it in on a location and a building where the uh, building owner has agreed to take on the long term maintenance costs. But I think you could re you could reduce those costs. You know, you, you probably don't need a visit maybe every single month. You could learn yourself how to check the irrigation system. You could probably do some simple um, end of year clearing of any nests or things like that, for example. Um, but I think ultimately my, my advice would be that they do need professional maintenance and you would need some kind of professional maintenance agreement to ensure you keep them looking good. Mm, no, thank you. And that leads actually into the next question. How long has Urban Green Up been funded for, which might uh, have something to do with the costs of the Green Wall in particular? Yeah, so our funding was spread over initially a five year period. Um, you know, a lot of work at the beginning to identify the projects. And then the idea was very much that we'd do a baseline study, we'd have everything go in fairly quickly over a six month period, and then we'd do two years post intervention monitoring. But obviously COVID kind of put paid to that really. So things have gone in fairly staggered um, and we've had an extra year's increase, no extra money sadly, but we have extended the project for an additional six year, which is now, and we will finish in May. And that's been to allow us to just get that little extra bit of data that we lost really during mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a question about funding from water companies from Tom Swithin Bank and how easy it was for you to get funding from them. OK, well, we didn't get any funding from the water company, so oh, I haven't got a magic then. wand. Yeah. <laughs> I've not, no, I've not made a breakthrough on that. We did work with United Utilities, who are a local water company, uh, and they were very interested. Um, but changes of personnel, COVID, the kind of the contacts were locked. And then um, when we tried to put the rain garden in, we tried very hard to work with United Utilities um, to make the various connections and stuff. And I think maybe we weren't with the right people within the organisation, but um, it would have been we had one issue at the very end I wanted to have a deeper part of the rain garden and I wanted to put in a tree to demonstrate that you can actually put a tree in a rain garden and we mm -hmm. would have had greater uh, water catchment areas as well but it meant excavating kind of at least a meter down because United Utilities were adamant that we connected at the bottom of the pipe and not part way down so they kind of stopped us doing some of the stuff we might have liked to have done um, I did hope that they might be a little bit more lenient on some of that um, and I think if I did it again I would I would establish a much stronger connection with them at the beginning mm -hmm. um, they are very keen I've met with them recently they're very interested in in helping us develop future uh, replicate rain gardens but at the time um, you know the rain garden took the best part of three and a half years it was one of the most challenging projects to deliver it wasn't a lot of it's hard we actually built a consortium of four companies to deliver it because I couldn't get people to come and do it from London for the price that I needed and um, mm, yeah. and it involved lots of different skills so it, having done one the second is always easier and you learn the lesson so I mm -hmm. would I would start with you you a lot earlier I think. Mm, definitely I'm sure yeah I'm sure highways and utilities are the the ones to, to win around aren't they always um, and another question from Don Noah the planting scheme for green up looks very complex on the strand for example is it permanent and how is it maintained? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it, it looks complex because um, we, there's planting at, at every single level, but really there's no more um, species than in a standard, um, very blocky um, pl planting scheme. Um, the, the difference is that we have um, sort of mixed all the plants together. And the benefit of doing that is that um, the, all the plants are suitable for the site. All the plants it kind of will look good together, but actually it really doesn't matter if the odd ragwort comes along or the odd kind of weed because, because it looks like a complex dynamic system. Actually, the, the weeds don't notice. And really, we, we've largely left um, a lot of the non-planted species in because um, each one of them will be suitable for a very specific um, pollinator. Um, so they, they, they really kind of benefit the scheme. And actually, you can't tell that they're in. We've only taken out um, the, the plants, when the weeds, when they get really invasive. There's two species which have got really invasive. Um, but literally, this was me and Green Jim and Ara on a, Wednesday, on a Monday night, just hand pulling. And because we've used the sand mulch, actually, they're incredibly easy and quick to, um, mm. to pull out. So an hour just does it once every... Um, two, two months and really sometimes I have to find them extra things to do 
<laughs> so, uh, so it's not as difficult. Complex doesn't mean um, more difficult and my more time consuming. Time consuming. Complex yeah. Complex just means it's been considered and it's suitable um, for for the site. Mm. And the other th um, the other question was about the permanence. I mean, it's, it's very dynamic. So I think we've got to get away from this idea that what we plant is what we have in, in 10 years time. The brief was for the planting to last 10 years, mm. um, which we're very confident it will, but it won't be the same. You're, the, the plant species mix has been designed so that it's got kind of annual species in that, which will only flower in the first year. And then it's got much kind of slower growing species in, in the mix that will kind of in year two and three start taking taking over. So it won't look the same every single year. But the, the other kind of point about it is, is that the, these annual mixes, they're, they, they're busy throwing all their um, their seeds around. So they so even though they're only annuals and it, they're only going to be where we planted them in the first year, actually they're going to start finding the locations which they're really happy growing and start germinating mm. those locations as well. Mm. So and keep, for me, keep it's going. all about changing our expectations about what a planting bed looks like and start to do things a bit differently. Mm. Well, a question from Johnny Helm, which is the other end of that involving trees. Um, and Johnny says, thank you, all really interesting presentations. And his question is around the urban catchment forestry trees. And was there ever a discussion to include more planting associated with this along the wider strand? It would have been amazing to see this strong green network that's been planted at the end of Blundell Street to expand across Liverpool. I'm sure you know where that is, Elaine. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think this is a question for Juliet. OK. Yes. Yeah, it probably is. Um, as far as I understand, um, the sorry, the dogs just started barking. As far as I understand, um, the uh, the strand scheme, uh, ours, we had the twenty trees kind of in the middle because we really wanted to test that urban catchment forestry and that sub stuff. But the the strand is also flanked by a number of other trees, and the works have been delivered over a number of phases. I think there's still a phase still to come, and I think in in total there'll be something like one hundred and thirty to one hundred and fifty trees that will go in along that mm. highway. Obviously, our experimental trees are those kind of working trees doing the flood alleviation in the in the central reservation um, there's also a range of um, other projects and uh, we work very closely with the Mersey Forest there's lots of funding available at the moment for trees uh, I think it's the problems we have is actually the capacity and the resources to deliver some of those projects because mm. obviously they take time and you need to go through all the permissions and the procurements but there's a whole range of like urban tree challenge funding um, that we, we have been accessing as a, a wider service in the council uh, and the, the intention is to you know put as many trees in as we can. I think also on the, um, the strand ones, those suds ones, because they're so high profile and because you know it's, it, we're going to have some very hopefully some very strong data um, and we've taken our highways colleagues and drainage colleagues on that journey with us, I'm kind of quite hopeful that these are schemes that will be replicated across the city in other developments and other highway schemes. And I'm already, mm. since, you know, working much, much closer with some of my colleagues in highways uh, about the introduction of things like additional rain gardens, um, you know, uh, planting in containers, etc. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it has been a bit of, Urban Greenup has provided a little bit of a sea change and a shift, really. Um, mm. So, so I hope that answers some of the questions anyway. Yes, sure. And I was just going to ask myself, um, you, you know, the data is incredible. And I think that's what shines out from this project, the, the value of that. Um, it, it's quite incredible in terms of scope and volume. So um, you've answered some of this, I think. But what, what are you planning to do with that in the future? For instance, um, the results of the pollinator planting, how will that impact the way that you maintain verges around the city in future yeah i'm thinking that i'm hoping the urban green up project when we've got all our data together next may will will provide that real shift to change so how mm. we're going to use the data well the first thing is the eu of afters as part of the extra years work to produce the lessons learned handbook because they're, they're often the most useful bits of information you know with people mm. trying to replicate or look at things again and that will be a publicly available also the city is just about liverpool is just about to publish its um, public realm master plan and, and obviously urban green up has had a reasonably big influence on that and you know they've already started to drop in rain gardens into you know future projected schemes which is fantastic um 
We'll also, this, the project will have a web portal that will be available that will contain all our data and you'll be able to log on when the project's finished and click on an area or click on a type of intervention and it will generate all the kind of graphs I was showing earlier, but, but complete and all the data, etc. So that will be available. Um, and in terms of how we use it internally, well, uh, partly driven by urban green up and partly driven by cost of living cuts, etc. Uh, one of the things that's been proposed this year in our budget is to actually cut 10% less of our grass, our amenity space. Mm. So if we're not going to cut it, we're going to have to manage it in another way. So, you know, the urban green up is providing alternatives that have all the benefits of things like biodiversity and will help to meet things like the future biodiversity net gain requirements. But the only thing I, I'm very conscious of at the moment is that does require a change in some of the skills because for a long time, we've the, the, the skill in maintaining open space, some of it has been somebody sat on a mower cutting grass, you know, almost every week given climate change now. Yeah. Whereas um, going forward, I think we need, it's a different kind of skill. The, the steamy lanes put together on the strand, for example, very low maintenance, which is great, um, you know, because, you know, we don't want to be going there every week and doing things, but it does require some level of horticultural knowledge. And I think mm -hmm. councils have lost some of that over the years. So that there are areas that we will that will be challenging and we'll need to plug those gaps. Mm, yes, definitely. I'm aware we've got a few minutes left to um, finalise a few other things, but I wanted to just ask one more question. I think we will run over a little bit because of the delay starting. Um, but of all the interventions that you both carried out through this project, which one was your favourite, had the most impact or demonstrated maybe the most innovation and best value? Have you got one favourite aspect each? Um, for, for, for me, it was um, the, the promise of what happens next year. So I'm really, I, I love the Strand site. This year, that's been far and away my favourite. But I'm really excited about our concrete revetment bank because it took it took a really long time to get going. We've got the um, the the sedums um, have really established very well, and they the bank turned bright um, yellow in in summer, which is quite quite amazing. You can see it mm. from uh, uh, over the other edge of the strand. But I've started seeing more more of the diversity of species that we we seeded into it coming up now. So I'm really excited to see what it what it's like mm. next next year. And I think it, we only spent two thousand pounds on on that particular site. It was a thousand pounds for seeds and a thousand pounds for for seeding. And I'm hoping with maybe you know another couple of hundred, we can start using all the the micro habitats which the um, the seed and plants have generated um, mm. to try and get more complex plants in there. So. Uh, at the moment, say the strand, but actually, I think by next year or the year after, it could it could have shifted. That's good value, isn't it, for money? <laughs> That's for sure. Juliet, have you got a favourite or most positive I've, I've impact? I've got two. Mm. Two actually, and they're they're just personal favourites. Um, the first one is the part the green the living green wall at Par Street because it was the first project really to go in. We'd never done anything like that really in the city. Um, and I love it because we've put in discovery planting. It's not got the best orientation for pollinators and, and uh, flowers, um, but uh, we have built in um, changes. So if you walk along that road ev every day during the year, in early in the, early in the year, you'll see snowdrops and daffodils. In the summer, you can pick strawberries. And at the winter now, if you go, there's plants there with red berries. So because it was the first big one to deliver, I thought it was great and it's remained my favorite. But mm. the other one, um, that is also my favourite, and it's not I've not shown it on the project. Is and we've done a, a a much larger floating island down in the docks. Lots of challenges with the salt water, um, and I think that was the one that kept me awake the most at night because it was so kind of different to anything we'd ever done before. Um, and I love it because the company that delivered it were really good, and um, it all went in very seamlessly, uh, and it's generated interest across the world. I've had so many inquiries from all around the world about that that salt wow. water floating island. Um, so, yeah, so they're favourites for different reasons. I think the impact of this one is going to grow and grow, isn't it? Definitely. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, I'll just round off now. Thank you both. Um, just about to close up and we've got to do the Christmas draw as well in the next few minutes. Um, oops, sorry, it's all gone horribly wrong. I went too far ahead. I hope that that's helped bring this to life. Um, and you can see now uh, the alignment, uh, sorry, the alignment with SDG 15 for all of us and particularly the landscape architects amongst us today how we can make positive changes in the work that we're doing in this area 
Um, our plan with the FICA series is to bring the SDGs to life and make them more tangible. So I hope that's been the case today. Um, do sign up to our email and then you will know all about, um, I don't know what's going on with my screen sharing, it's taking its time, but you will know all about uh, upcoming FICAs. And I apologise again for this morning. I'm not sure why that was uh, so chaotic and blaming Zoom. I believe we did everything correctly. Uh, but do make sure you're signed up and you'll hear more about everything that we're doing next year. Um, also following us on social media, uh, we, we share obviously everything there, particularly Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, and just finally, we are planning next year, hoping to uh, get some program together and share it with you very soon. So watch this space. They are all available from the last couple of years, our speakers on our website. So you can find them. And certainly today, if you missed the beginning, please do go there and catch up. And obviously, our formal CPDs are still available if you're suffering from withdrawal from hearing about uh, everything that we're doing. And many of them um, count towards the Landscape Institute's requirement of a minimum five hours a year on the climate emergency. And certainly this one would count for that. Um, so do get in touch with us directly if you need um, any information about those. I'm hoping you can see my screen. It's, it's died. I'm not sure if, uh, if you can see it or not anymore. But anyway, I'll keep going. Um, and finally, now we need to draw the competition winners from this year for the trip to Oslo and the Plus uh, next summer, we think. Um, I hope you can hear me over this drum roll. We're drawing one speaker from our series and one listener randomly from everybody who's been involved this last year. And the winner of, sorry, the, winner of the speaker uh, list is Michelle Williams from Igloo. I don't think either of these people are actually listening in today, which is a shame. Um, and I don't know either of them really well enough to <laughs> to uh, share that with them right now, but we'll be in touch with them if they, they're not with us today. And the winner of the FICA attendee is Amy Birdbidge from Homes England, um, somebody again we've never met, so that'll be interesting. Um, do keep listening. You have as much of a chance as anybody else in winning these obviously not for this year now but uh, we will be running this again next year and we're, we're very keen to take more people over to see Oslo and the plus uh, the meeting we had over there this year was incredible um, and that's really it from us we need to say goodbye now and let you go I'm sure everyone has deadlines pre-Christmas and work to be done so thank you everyone for joining today and uh, especially Juliet and Elaine for sharing their fascinating insight into this really incredible project. My colleagues, Matt and Jack, who are helping out in the background and hopefully managed to sort out the tech issues and get most of you in to join us. And uh, thank you and Merry Christmas. And uh, we hope to see you again next year. I don't know if you want to say goodbye, Elaine and Juliet as well. Um, I will vanish shortly, but it's now's your chance. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time, and we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye. Bye.